Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. I am pleased to, to get started and with our first mayor council breakfast since the council has returned uh, from recess. Uh, and think everybody has an agenda before them um, with what we're going to discuss uh, today. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to introduce uh, several members uh, who, uh, who have been newly appointed to my cabinet and ask that you uh, also get a chance to chat with them if you haven't already. Uh, and certainly for the three of them that require confirmation, we would love to work uh, with the committee directors to have them um, before the council as soon as possible. Uh, first, Jeff Marudian, I've appointed as the acting director of this, the district's Department of Transportation. Uh, many of you know Jeff from his interim role, certainly uh, his tenure with the Obama administration uh, and, and before that uh, with DDOT too. So we welcome Jeff, uh, who has uh, really hit the ground running in, in representing DDOT. I also want to introduce Matthew McAuliffe, also well known to the council. Council, uh, who I appointed a couple of months back as the acting director of the Office of Disability Rights. Uh, Matthew has, in his previous function uh, with the Office of Disability Rights, worked with the council and the disability um, communities uh, to, to make sure that laws and policies uh, were in place, that are in place, that help all of our residents in the district. So uh, congratulations on your promotion, Matthew. Uh, also, I want to uh, acknowledge the appointment of Jennifer Reed as the director of the Mayor's Office of Budget and Performance. Uh, Jenny, of course, spent eight years working with a, a D.C. Fiscal Policy Institute. I appointed her as Deputy Budget Director at the beginning of my term. I then appointed her the Director of, of the District's Chief Performance Officer, and she is now uh, the Director of the Combined Function of Budget and Performance um, for, for my office. So congratulations, Jenny, on your promotion. I also want to introduce to you uh, Christopher Rodriguez who is the acting director of uh, the Department of Homeland Security. Christopher comes to us um, with, uh, after a, a, a career in the CIA and most recently as the HCMA director for the state of New Jersey. So we welcome uh, all of the new appointees and congratulate those who have been promoted. So uh, also I wanted to note that this week uh, we're focusing our Safer Stronger DC initiatives and uh, Safer Stronger DC uh, week. And uh, I want to uh, thank all of the members of the council uh, that in announce and invite you all to a ribbon cutting that we will be doing uh, in Ward 7 at 142nd Street Northeast. Uh, and that will be the location of the new Safer Stronger office of Neighborhood Safety and Community Engagement. Uh, you will remember the uh, NEAR Act legislation authored by Councilmember McDuffie that moved to the council over the last year and that was funded in uh, the uh, fiscal 2018 budget. Uh, this office, and I would turn to Councilmember McDuffie to say more about the, the aim of the legislation, uh, but a central part of it is that we will have a director of, of the new Safety and Community Engagement Office uh, who's focused on uh, violence disruption. Uh, we will also have community uh, uh, a, a team of folks uh, who are focused on violence uh, disruption. So that announcement, once again, will be uh, this uh, Wednesday. Uh, we'll also be talking on Thursday about other technology that we will make available to all residents uh, to provide even more help in the case of emergency. Uh, on today's agenda, we want to uh, start off a discussion of public safety um, by talking about uh, funded initiatives with this budget for um, police officers in the District of Columbia, and the Chief of Police will provide that update. And another very key part of our public safety initiatives has to do with the D.C. Department of Forensic Sciences, which I want to acknowledge Chairman Mendelson for his long uh, focus on our DFS and our certain, uh, certainly our focus over the last three years on making sure that DFS has the resources it needs. So Dr. <coughs> Smith will provide 
us with an update, and you also have um, its annual report, um, the DFS annual report, uh, at your table. I also asked uh, Chief uh, Financial Officer DeWitt to, to come in. There's certainly a lot circulating about uh, proposals at the federal level for tax cuts, tax reform, tax whatever, uh, and uh, any and all of them uh, may have an impact on our residents um, and whatever federal changes that impact uh, them having more or less money uh, have an impact on, on, on the district as well. Likewise, uh, Director Wayne Turnage from um, our, our Office of Healthcare Finance, the Director of our Office of Healthcare Finance, I should say, will talk about the potential impacts of um, federal activity related to the Children's Insurance Program. Um, Mr. Mendelson has also um, presented several topics that the council wants to focus on that, that are included on your agenda, including WMATA, the 2018 All-Star Game, and the 50th anniversary of um, the assassination of Martin Luther King and the impact on the district. Um, will, are on the agenda. And Attorney General Racine will also um, present a report on uh, activity in the Attorney General's office. So, Mr. Mendelson, I wanted to turn to you for comments before we get started with the presentations. Uh, thank you, Mayor Bowser. Um, this, as everybody knows, is we, do all, every, we alternate every month uh, who's hosting this breakfast. So thank you for hosting <laughs> this today. Um, I don't have any... Um, introductory remarks congratulations to each of your new uh, appointments i'm kind of curious uh the h h SEMA director chris matthews rodriguez i'm Christopher sorry for rodriguez for h SEMA. yes um formerly with the cia curious to know if he will reveal any of his secrets <laughs> or yours <laughs> That's a blank page. <laughs> Stop there. So why don't, <laughs> Mr. Attorney General, Mr. Attorney General, it's a blank page. I'm sorry. Sir. It's a blank page. It's a blank page. Okay. <laughs> don't look forward to staying up at night reading. Uh, so why don't we proceed? We've got to no, yeah. <laughs> go for it, Jack. Uh, so why don't we proceed with the agenda? Sure, uh, Chief. All right, good morning, and thanks, Mayor, for giving me this opportunity to present on some uh, recruitment and retention initiatives that we're, uh, we're very excited about. Uh, I had the opportunity this past weekend, uh, major city chiefs, uh, the International Association of Chiefs of Police, and the Police Executive Research Forum all met in Philadelphia this past weekend. Uh, when I meet with leadership of other organizations like this, it, it convinces me uh, that the Metropolitan Police Department is the best police department in the country, and this these recruitment and retention in, uh, initiatives will make us better. Uh, so just to start off, we can go to the first slide I have up here. And this shows you where we are, the state of affairs right now with regards to the size of the force. This is at the end of fiscal uh, 2017. Uh, we had 3,821 uh, 3, sworn members. Uh, that's an increase of 84. Uh, members from fiscal year 2016. Uh, this includes 56 senior sergeants and 16 senior detectives. The reason I put that note in there is because at the end of fiscal 18 or the beginning of fiscal 19, uh, those positions will expire. Uh, so in um, fiscal 2017, it was the first year that we've had a positive uh, increase in the size of our force uh, since fiscal 2013. And with regards to civilians, we've been able to increase in fiscal uh, 2017 uh, by 58 civilian members. Whenever we bring in civilian positions, uh, frequently those positions will take the place of sworn officers. And so that also increases uh, the ability of our sworn officers to police our city. The six-month rental assistance program, and again, I want to thank the mayor and the council for giving us this money. This allows uh, new recruits a thousand dollars a month uh, for up to six months uh, to get uh, a place here in the city, a rental place here in the city. Uh, I believe this will this will be beneficial in two ways. It'll be able to attract. Uh, young people who are starting their lives uh, to come and be able to afford a place here in the district. Uh, and I'm also hopeful that once we get these young people uh, who don't 
now live in the city to come and live in the city, that they'll stay in the city for their entire careers. Um, so if you can look at the details right there, it's a, uh, they will sign a six-month obligated service agreement if they take advantage of this program. Uh, that is six months on top of the two-year obligated service agreement uh, that they're required to sign uh, to w when they become recruits. And so uh, just for clarification, uh, recruit officers have to complete their training at the academy, uh, and they uh, re essentially uh, get promoted into becoming full sworn officers. Uh, frequently, officers don't, not frequently, but they're, from time to time, we have officers that don't get to that point. Um, so if they don't get to that point, they, they will actually be um, separated from the job. But if they get to that point, uh, they will have a two-year obligated service agreement. And if they take advantage of this program, it'll be two and a half years uh, that they will be with us. And we have, you can look at the bottom, we have $1 million to implement this program. Go to the next slide. The Employer Assisted Housing Program, we did an announcement on this the other day. Uh, this is uh, more in line with being able to get our, our first responders, giving them the ability to purchase homes in the District of Columbia. Mm -hmm. Some of the highlights of the program is they can get a deferred 0% loan of up to $20,000 uh, to be able to purchase a home. That's available to all D.C. government employees. Uh, they can get a matching down payment of funds of up to $15,000. That's specific uh, to first responders. Uh, so that helps them with their down payment. And then the last piece is, and this is also eligible for first responders, is a $10,000 forgivable loan. Uh, the way that works is if they purchase a home in the District of Columbia, uh, they get $10,000. If they stay in that home for five years, then they do not have to pay that loan back. Uh, you can look at the bottom. I believe there's $1.8 million that are budgeted uh, for this program. We're very excited. Uh, at the announcement uh, of this program the other day, we actually had a firefighter that came forward and told a great story about how him and his family were able to purchase a home here in the District of Columbia. Uh, our police officer retention program, or what we uh, call at MPD PORP, uh, is the ability to give folks um, $12,500 in student loan forgiveness or tuition reimbursement. Uh, the two groups that we're trying to retain right now, and we've done this by looking at folks who are most likely to leave, is the folks who are in the three to eight year category of service. Uh, and, and the other group is people that are eligible to retire. If they take advantage of this program, they will sign a obligated service agreement. So if you're eligible to retire, you will be obligated to stay for an additional three years. Um, and for the people in the three to eight year age uh, or years of service range, they will sign a four year obligated service agreement. And you know, when we took, took a look at this, if, if you look at folks uh, that get past their 11th or 12th year on the Metropolitan Police Department, they're more likely to stay uh, for the rest of their careers or for a, at least a full 25 years. Uh, we have $900,000 that's been budgeted uh, for this program. And then the last piece to this is we, are, we have a statement of work uh, at the Office of Contracting and Pro Procurement to be able to, to bring in a group that can uh, help us, assist us in recruiting people who want to become uh, police officers. I'll talk real briefly about our civilianization for 2018. We were funded for 10 positions. Uh, three positions are posted, seven are now uh, still being classified. Uh, we also uh, received additional money for increasing the size of our cadet pool. Uh, right now, we have 51 police cadets. Uh, for those of you who don't know, our cadet program allows uh, young people to come. They work for the Metropolitan Police Department. While they're working for the Metropolitan Police Department, we uh, provide them two years of education at the University of the District of Columbia. Uh, this past year, uh, thanks to the mayor and the council, we were able to increase the age range for people that were eligible uh, to participate in this program. So it went up to the age of 24. And if you can look at those numbers up there, it's almost equally divided of young people between the ages of 17 and 20 and we have 25 that have taken advantage of the program 
Uh, and what will happen is after they get their 60 college credits, they'll be able to matriculate into becoming police officers. And the most important part of this program is our cadets or kids who uh, live in the, the District of Columbia. The last piece is the Anacostia Public Safety Academy. We have 38 students right now uh, from the uh, 10th grade, 11th grade, and the 12th grade. Uh, what this program does is we have a really great uh, teacher over there who uh, gets these kids interested in, in becoming police officers. I think it's really important that our young people in the city uh, be able to develop a relationship uh, with our police officers. I think this gives young people a good sense as to what policing is all about. You know, I've met with these kids uh, over at Anacostia a number of times. These are really good kids, and a lot of these kids are uh, leaders within their own groups. And so I think my sense is that if, if you know, as, as young leaders, if other young kids see them uh, matriculating into either becoming cadets or matriculating in, into becoming police officers, I think more young people in our city uh, will be interested in becoming police officers. And I think that'll be a good thing for the District of Columbia. <coughs> Lastly, uh, we launched our new recruiting website, uh, and it's called jointmpd.dc.gov. Uh, that's uh, one of the things that we're doing to try and attract people from across this uh, country, but particularly from this region, to become police officers in the District of Columbia. And I can take any questions I believe that anyone has. All right, thank you. <clears throat> yes. I think quick question. Uh, you know, first, uh, I want to commend you on one of these efforts. These seem like really solid steps increase our force and, and really to have more folks who live in the district, particularly in our police department. Uh, the, the one question I have is, is just about it, and I know you've discussed it, and know your predecessor discussed it, but I can't remember the details of the training timelines. There's some kind of, you know, capacity issue with the number of officers we can train per year, if you could help me um, understand that. So for, for to train sworn recruits, we probably have the capacity to uh, to train about 300, and that that's... Uh, based on the, uh, the amount of space that we have at the academy, the amount of training people that we have at the academy. So we can bring in about 30 new recruits per year. You know, with the senior police officer program, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, 30 per, per month. Uh, yeah, so it's about 300 a year. Uh, with the senior police officer program, it's, it's an abbreviated training that they go through depending on how long they have, it's been since they left the police department, so we're able to get those folks out on the street a lot quicker. Charles, uh, thanks, Chief, for running through this. I think <clears throat> when we think about our our officers overall, when uh, it's about one in five of our, of our officers call the district home, reside in the district, um, and obviously we're working hard to increase that. Um, so I do think the the housing programs, both the uh, the rental assistance program uh, that the mayor made a big emphasis and push on through the budget, the um, housing purchase program that the committee helped create along with Councilmember Bonds. I think combined, I think we're going to make a really big difference in helping make sure that our officers are um, able to uh, afford to live in D.C. and call it home. Um, so those are great things. I wanted to also ask you, because while we're putting a lot of emphasis on the front end, trying to make sure that we have officers that are living here, which I think helps stabilize our force, we also have the separations from MPD have been slowing over the last couple of years. I think those two things speak to just a greater stability um, in the overall force numbers. And didn't know if you just wanted to touch on on that and kind of what you're seeing in terms of the slowing of the separations um, of the force. Yeah, if you look at the, you know, if you look at the numbers since 20, uh, fiscal year 13, uh, moving forward, um, in fiscal 13, we had about 197 uh, separations. Uh, and then it went up to, in fiscal 15, as, as high as 414. And now it's starting to decrease. In 16, fiscal 16, we went to 387. And then fiscal 17, we went to 335. Uh, I think the more telling uh, number is the number of uh, resignations. And what happens is, you know, back in 2013 and 2014, we weren't hiring as many police officers as we were. Whenever you have new officers coming on to the force, uh, you're going to have some people that come into this profession. They decide they don't want to do it, and they don't leave. So you're going to have more resignations. So our resignations have been, uh, over that period, 15, 16, and 17, have been going down, which I think is a good sign. I, I agree. That's why I, I wanted to make sure you hit that, yep. too, because I think you're, we're, we're all, I think, pulling the same direction of trying to help improve the way in which we have our officers coming in and then calling D.C. home. But then I think there's also a good story to be told around how that separation is slowing 
which overall I think just creates a more and more stable force. Yep, uh, I agree, and I, and I think part of that is making sure that our police officers, uh, first of all, well trained, first, and then you have to make sure that they're safe, and make sure they're working in an environment that, that you know, which which is a good environment to work in. Yeah. Thanks, Chief. Uh, Councilmember White. <clears throat> yes, Chief. Um, I guess at one point we had about five thousand officers, um, and some of the pushback I get when I talk about coverage in certain areas is a lack of officers or availability of officers in certain PSAs. Uh, what would a healthy uh, full capacity police department look like in numbers? I see you got about 84 uh, new officers. What does a healthy department look like? You know, I get that question uh, quite a bit. I feel very comfortable with the size of our force right now. Uh, I do know that, you know, you, you will some from time to time hear folks in community saying they want to see, see more police officers. I have to look at the metrics that we have. Uh, one of the, the metrics that I look at is the amount of violent crime that we have our, in our city. And if you look at 2009 to 2016, violent crime in our st city has been steadily decreasing. If you compare 2017 so far to 2016, we have another 25% uh, reduction in violent crime. I think the other thing that I look at as a metrics is the police department's ability to respond to priority one calls for service. So over that same time frame, 2019 to 2016, while the population has been increasing in the District of Columbia in the neighborhood of almost 100,000 additional people and calls for service have been going up, uh, the ability of the police department to respond to priority one calls for service has actually decreased. So those are the metrics that I look at. Um, sometime I think there's a misimpression uh, by some in our community uh, that the presence of a police officer, the mere presence of a police officer will prevent a crime. I don't think that's necessarily true. And I do have that conversation with the community. So you're saying we good where we are now? I feel comfortable with the size of the force right now. I, I think we had 5,000 police officers. It might have been when I came on. Uh, and I don't want to give anyone a sense as to how old I am, so I'm going to stay away from that. Uh, I think we had 4,000 as recently as 2013, uh, but we've been operating in this 3,800 range for a, a, a fair amount of time, and uh, we're doing fairly well. And last question, are you all looking to expand the Public Safety Academy in any other schools? I would love to be able to do that. Uh, so there are some com conversations going on right now. I think that really attracting young people from the District of Columbia uh, into the profession of policing is really going to start with programs like that. So I'm, I'm a firm believer in the program. Uh, I would like to be able to do that. Councilmember White, let me just note, we it was 5,000, I think, in 1970. So you came on before that? Is that what oh, I thought, I thought, <laughs> <laughs> Mr. I, I thought we weren't going to get into that. <laughs> yes, we did. <laughs> Mr. McDuffie? Hey, Chief, just a quick question to follow up. I know the mayor mentioned the Office of Neighborhood Safety and Engagement. I'm really excited about that office opening, as I'm sure a lot of people in the community are. Um, the NAIR Act also had some provision that uh, uh, required the MPD to start to collect additional data around stops and frisk and use of force, uh, and also uh, some requirements around additional training for officers. How, how's the department coming with the compliance with those aspects of the NAIR? Yeah, the training piece of it is, is, is uh, going very well. We have the training. We're, we're, we're able to provide the training to our officers that's required in the NEAR Act. Uh, the data issue is a little bit more difficult because we have to adjust our systems, and there's, there's a, a cost associated with that, but we are working towards accomplishing that. Um, Madam Mayor, why don't we move on to the DFS report? Sure. Dr. Smith. Thank you, Chief. Good morning. Um, as we're getting the slides set up, I'd like to thank everyone for the opportunity to talk to you about the improvements we've made in the Department of Forensic Sciences over the last couple of years. Um, we have released our uh, report on calendar year 2016, and this uh, uh, report we've entitled Stronger Science, Safer Streets. So as we're getting the slides set up, or not. <laughs> I can. Yeah, oh, great. Well, we'll just start with hard copies. That's perfect. So if you turn to the first page, we see a picture of our uh, DFS Stakeholder Council. As many of you know, the agency was established five years ago. We moved into the beautiful Consolidated Forensic Laboratory, and we are, are independent of law enforcement. And we're one of only two uh, forensic labs in the country that act independent of law enforcement. Of course, we are not independent to you or to the mayor. 
but we are guided by our stakeholder council. It looks like we have the slides. And these stakeholder councils, you'll see these symbols and, and uh, seals from these organizations that are critically involved in public safety and public health here in the city. It's an interesting collection because it represents not only law enforcement, but also attorneys from the prosecution side as well as the defense side. So this council reminds me every day of the type of work that we should be doing because these are our critical decision makers um, and our science needs to support them. The other thing that I want to talk about, when I got there in um, 15, at the end of fiscal year 15, uh, the department had on, undergone some very large changes uh, due to some quality issues. The mayor had had to start stop uh, DNA testing. Uh, we had major backlogs in our firearms and fingerprint units. We were detached, quite honestly, from some of our critical stakeholders. So uh, under the Safer Stronger plan that the mayor has put into place and you guys have supported, um, we have gotten substantial increases in funding to help us fix these critical issues. And this slide just shows um, that we have benefited <laughs> greatly by an influx of, of money as well as personnel to help with these, some of these issues that had accumulated within uh, the department. So one of the things we worked on very hard was to get our arms around the types of data and the types of information, the samples that we were tracking. Uh, we instituted a laboratory information management system. We, we finalized the implementation of that. And we also put on top of it something we, I call the DFS dashboard that allows me to actually track key performance indicators. Uh, how are these cases moving through the laboratory? And all of the individual managers that have oversight over the, the units are able to tap into this information. And today I'll share some of the improvements that have happened. This chart shows the um, ability of the latent fingerprint unit with uh, additional resources provided by contractor support to work alongside of our latent fingerprint examiners to basically bring down the backlog that's shown in the red line um, as well as increase the output. So the blue line shows the monthly reporting of certain critical cases and um, basically shows that as we got this additional support, we, will, we were able to be more productive. And you'll see this throughout the other units as I go through the presentation. The other thing that was uh, really valuable, I think, uh, has been our ability to input data into what are called our intelligence databases. So uh, the Department of Forensic Sciences is fortunate to be tied into other organizations through these databases, such as the Automated Fingerprint Identification System, which we call APHIS. So we put in unknown prints, prints that come from crime scenes, and those prints can be connected either to other crime scenes or perhaps to individuals who print, whose prints are in APHIS. And the smaller bar at the bottom reflects the amount of information going in in 2015. Um, and you can see we dramatically input or increased our ability to put that information to APHIS in 2016. So we uh, only had about 1,000 entries in 2015. We had over 7,000 in 2016. And the bottom line for that means the more information you put in, the more connections you make. And the red bar indicates how many additional hits or connections we were able to um, create because now our examiners were able to put in that information. The uh, case that is referred to as sort of a typical result of this. So we have uh, uh, latent fingerprints coming in from a, a, a B2 or a B1 burglary. We were able to not only show additional connections to 11 other events and, and burglaries, but we were also able to identify the person responsible for that. And that's, again, because we're feeding the system. And we have other examples of such connections. The other value of fingerprints, you know, sometimes through the popular television shows, um, people get a perspective that certain types of data is more important than others. DNA often gets the sort of the gold star. But in reality, we're seeing the value of fingerprints. It touches on all different types of crime here in the city. So as we've been able to get this fingerprint unit healthier, we've been able to affect and provide information against all these different types of violations. Uh, we see the same trend with firearms. In our firearms unit, again, we had additional contractor support that came in, and we began to reduce the backlog that existed, as shown by the red line, and increase the amount of reports we were able to put out on a monthly basis. 
our intelligence database that we use for firearms is called NIVIN. We refer to it as NIVIN. And as with the fingerprint database, the more information we put in in 2016 allowed us to ultimately get final hit information as is reflected in this particular case. So uh, firearm was uh, collected, it was brought to the lab, uh, it was test fired, the, uh, the markings on that bullet were basically put into the NIVIN system, and this firearm was ultimately connected to a homicide. And we can provide that information to the investigators, um, which allows them to ultimately bring resolution to these investigations. Finally, DNA. This was, uh, you know, very problematic. DNA testing had been stopped. It took us nine months, but as of February 2016, we were able to uh, uh, begin DNA testing again. We did it in a much improved way. We were the seventh lab in the country to implement uh, a new way to interpret mixtures. Uh, we have survived and uh, done very well on two external audits since opening the DNA unit. And uh, we even see an increase in productivity. We were able to bring the analysts on board, and we were also able, through the additional funding, to send samples out to contract labs to keep DNA testing going. And I'm proud to say, despite all of this, we've also worked very hard to actually eliminate the sexual assault kit backlog um, that exists in the city. Um, and that's through all the support that we receive from everybody in this room. Our final database that we'd like to talk about is the CODIS system, our DNA combined index system. And just as with the others, we were able to input large amounts of data into it during 2016, and that resulted in 193 different connections, either tying crime scenes together or individuals to crimes. This case reflects, again, a typical case where an individual is a, uh, involved in a robbery. They leave uh, their skull cap behind, an item of evidence. We get DNA from that. We put that into the CODIS system, and it was actually able to give us a name at the end. This individual had been previously convicted. Their profile was in the CODIS system, and so that allowed us to uh, link that individual to that particular piece of evidence. So the value of DNA, I like to, um, I was tasked and, and we spoke to Deputy Mayor Donahue about, you know, you show me all these hits, but what do they really mean? So a lot of the effort we're um, doing this year is to really look at these hits, what is the result of them, how, do, how many cases are, uh, is, are we able to close, and so by looking at 188 of the hits that occurred in 2016, CODIS assisted in the closure of 62% of MPD's cases. So again, we're trying to dig even deeper into this data to see what does, at the end of the day, what is the impact um, for the city. We were also, in addition to this, able to open up two new um, capabilities, and I won't spend a lot of time talking about this, but I'm excited to say we are moving into forensic chemistry and are, we are opening, opening up our drug lab here in the city. Uh, we had provided some subject matter expertise in the early uh, part of FY16 uh, uh, to Mr. Racine here um, as he tried to work on improving some of the legislation around synthetic cannabinoids and opioids. Uh, we also started doing some testing for the Department of Corrections and Medical Examiner's Office. These were tests that the DEA laboratory, DEA currently does most of the testing for the city, but they weren't able to do all of the testing in support of, say, investigative needs. So we started doing that. We, we utilized, I utilized four chemists that actually work out of our public health lab to begin this testing. Um, we were given an enhancement in this year's budget to get two new positions. Uh, to build this even further, and our hope is to take over uh, all of the drug testing in the city sometime in calendar year 2018 following uh, receipt of accreditation. And the other uh, new capability we've uh, focused on is uh, building up our digital evidence unit. These people are very clever and they're able to um, extrapolate and take data from cell phones and cars and all the things that uh, we put a lot of information into, they can uh, take that information out of and assist with different investigations. So we have a pretty active digital evidence unit. And finally, I think the bottom line, as uh, the 
Chief just referred to, this table actually provided to us from MPD reflects the decrease in, in crime, in both violent crime and property crimes um, from 2015. Uh, through 2016. We'd like to say that um, as with all of the other uh, agencies, we are a part of that and as we provide stronger science, we are also supporting safer streets here in the city. Happy to take any questions. May, may I just say, um, and th let me thank you, Dr. Smith, for, for your incredible leadership of the department and also to um, the members of the council. In the early part of the presentation, Dr. Smith talked about the, the real infusion of resources that we had. Um, what we know is that in, in 2015, uh, we had a beautiful building there, but we really hadn't over the years since we started DFS put the money behind hiring up for that new department. Uh, and so that's what we have been able to do over the last uh, several years. I know Dr. Smith has also worked very hard on um, where she had uh, most of her investigators, her crime scene investigators were MPD. Um, we have been able to make sure a good number of them, if not all, and you'll tell us, uh, officers, sworn officers can return to um, the duties that only they can do um, and we can have civilians in um, the investigatory roles at DFS. So those things are um, really, really um, g going well. And so we're very proud of, of this, this change. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Che? Yes. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you. Um, could you just tell me, uh, do we do uh, DNA swabs of people who are uh, arrested in serious crimes like Maryland? And do we do DNA swabs of, you know, cheek swabs of um, people who are convicted? Do we do either or both of those? So we are a part of the CODA system, and there is a, a, a collection of swabs sometimes associated with an arrest, but we do not database those. We don't keep those profiles as they do in Maryland. The convicted offender swabs can be taken, and those are actually processed by the FBI currently for the district. And then those profiles end up in the CODA system. So the difference between Maryland and us, we don't keep, we don't just keep swabs from individuals who have just been arrested of crimes. Okay, but we do do the swabs for people who are arrested, but then it's, the data is kept by the FBI? Well, those swabs would only be collected if it was, a, if they were in some ways suspected of a, of a crime. Serious crime, yeah. right. But it's, it's not to keep it, it's to only do the comparison at the time of the case. So a side-by-side -side comparison as a reference sample. I see. Sense? So you wouldn't keep it so that if there were an incident later on, That's the matching correct. wouldn't be possible? That's correct. That's correct. Thank That's you. for the arrested people who have not been convicted. That's correct. That's correct. So that is a, uh, and in order to do that, states have to pass laws to allow us to put those arrested profiles into the, and retain them. Councilmember White. Uh, uh, thank you, and uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Smith, both for your work. Um, certainly, I think the agency did cause a little bit of, uh, of uh, consternation for the city a couple yes. of years ago. Uh, so I commend you on uh, really quick work in the agency. Um, question about the uh, digital evidence. Are you all working with uh, OAG to, um, to to understand the, uh, I guess, the, the, the most current court rulings on uh, search and seizure of, uh, of this type of digital evidence on phones on cars that we can kind of do our best to, to stay ahead of the legal curve. And second part of that question is, is there anything the council can do? I've not, not read the court rulings on this, but is there anything the council can do to pass laws that would perhaps give you the authority and avoid some uh, legal concerns down the road? So um, we always work uh, with the, uh, whenever a warrant is brought to us and we know that we have a legal right to look at that particular data, we certainly can provide subject matter experts to work with any individuals, such as the council or um, uh, Mr. Racine, to improve any laws or address those. But right now, we're more the subject matter experts, and, and we will only do what we are legally allowed to do. Um, but Don't need that, uh, upon request. Yes, we would work upon request to assist with that. Uh, Madam Mayor, why don't we move on to the next item? Mr. Chairman, may I just uh, add one thing? I'm sorry. Um, 
I certainly share the mayor's observations, um, you know, prior to Dr. Smith, and I believe you put Dr. Mitchell uh, in charge as acting for a while. Yes, yes. Um, the office or the building was grand, it's but empty. very <laughs> inactive. Uh, and Dr. Mitchell and certainly Dr. Smith have completely changed that culture. I do note that the rape kit um, status is extraordinary. Uh, so many other states are struggling in that area, and so I commend you for being so diligent with MPD on that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And I echo those comments Thank as well. You. May I introduce the Director Turnage to talk about the Children's Health Insurance Program. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, let me turn your attention to uh, actually. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry about that. Uh, I want to quickly discuss uh, uh, four issues this morning. I want to talk a little bit about the uh, structure and design of CHIPPIN so you can see how um, the Children's Health Insurance Program is financed to the district's benefit. Uh, talk a little bit about the uncertainty around reauthorization uh, and what that might mean for the district in terms of fiscal year 18 funding. Um, the discuss a little bit also uh, the President's recent decision to end cost sharing payments. Uh, and the impact on the district, which is fortunately very minimal. Uh, I would turn your attention to slide three as a uh, quick overview of, how, of what CHIP is. It's, a, it's the local jointly federal state finance uh, insurance program for children. It was specifically uh, put in place to encourage states to <coughs> extend beyond the Medicaid program's eligibility to cover kids who were uninsured. Uh, there are really three options that states can pursue when setting up their CHIP program. Uh, the district chose the first option, which is to make the program look like Medicaid. Once you do that, you're locked into certain uh, decisions uh, around benefit structure uh, and cost sharing, which is very minimal in Medicaid. If you choose any of the other two options, uh, you have significant flexibility to constrain benefits and impose premiums and other cost sharing mechanisms. Uh, if you go to slide four, uh, you will see that, uh, as a reminder, the district's Medicaid match is 70 percent. We get 70 percent of our uh, costs funded by the federal government. We send them, uh, you know, bills every quarter, and they simply match it with 70 percent uh, uh, a drawdown. Uh, under uh, CHIP, the match is 79 percent, uh, which is, is, is substantially uh, uh, higher than uh, you would see in some other states. Uh, as a part of the Affordable Care Act, uh, in, from fiscal year 16 through fiscal year 19, uh, legislation was passed that actually increased the uh, match rate uh, on the enhanced match for CHIP to 20, by 23 percentage points. So because the district is at 79% uh, for their enhanced CHIP match, we could all we could go up to 100% with that 29%, 23% ceiling and have the federal government cover the entire cost of the uh, 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 enhanced CHIP program. Um, now, the, di the key difference, even with a 100% federal match, there is a difference between how this how this finance and operates with respect to uh, the Medicaid program. And Medicaid is an entitlement. Uh, once somebody is determined eligible and they present for uh, medical necessary services uh, that are covered by the program, uh, the district has to pay. Uh, and even if it's beyond what's in your budget, you have to pay. The federal government will make good on their share. CHIP is very different. You get a, a specific allotment and you have two years to spend it. And if you spend more than your allotment within those two years, then you have to cover it with your local money. If you spend less than your allotment, then your surplus goes into a pot that's redistributed to states that spend more than their allotment. Um, and if you, if there is no surplus funding and you spend more than your allotment, then you obviously have to cover the difference. So in light of that, if you look at slide five, um, this gives you a picture of where we are with CHIP in terms of the enrollment and the cost to the district. As you can see, the uh, Medicaid program uh, serves roughly 94, with CHIP, roughly 94,000 kids. 85% um, of those kids are legacy Medicaid. They come in through the Medicaid window. Uh, the other 15% come in through CHIP, and that cost, uh, the total cost is $47.4 million. But again, because of the uh, uh, very uh, um, generous financing uh, scheme in place, the federal government covers 100% of that cost. If you uh, turn to slide seven, as you know, the uh, uh, CHIP is reauthorized 
I think it's every four years, and uh, the current reauthorization expired in fiscal year 17. It expired in, in uh, September of, of, of this year. And there are efforts to extend the program, and it's not unusual that the uh, efforts to extend uh, get dragged out beyond the uh, uh, year of extension. Um, the, there, is a, there are companion bills in both the House and the Senate. Uh, they both have uh, features that would be favorable if they were to pass. Uh, they get, it would be a five-year extension. The 23% bump would be uh, uh, put back in place, and it would guarantee the district 100% federal funding uh, for fiscal years uh, 18 and 2019. Um, there, there are requirements that sustain what we call the maintenance of uh, uh, effort. Uh, and that is, the, if you run the, um, uh, the first option that we talked about, you, you make your CHIP program look like Medicaid, uh, you are subject to the requirement that your, whatever your eligibility uh, system is in place, you have to maintain those eligibility levels. You can't back off of them. Uh, the, the, uh, there are key differences. The Senate bill is bipartisan, uh, and it does not address funding, which is a little worrisome. And the House bill is, is, is very partisan, and it pays for the CHIP extensions with some fairly onerous cuts uh, or take back from the Medicaid program. So that is where the fight will uh, our focus. Uh, if you go to the next slide, you know, the question is what um, happens if they fail to reauthorize um, in fiscal year 18, uh, slide eight, I'm sorry. The, 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 um, the failure to reauthorize will result in the district losing what is essentially a 100% federal match. Uh, we do have, because we are a state that uh, uses uh, our, our chip dollars. We are we can we are eligible for uh, the, some of the surplus uh, reallocation. Uh, that's about 14.7 million dollars. When you add that to what we have for fiscal year 17, we have enough money to take us through the end of December, roughly. Uh, if we don't get anything done, if the federal government doesn't get anything done by the end of December, we would not be able to make the managed care payments that reflect the full cost of chip in January for the whole month of January. Uh, so depending on what happens. Uh, with the reauthorization and the timing of it, the district could uh, be faced with a, a 9.8 to 12.5 million dollar uh, local pressure uh, to cover about 14, 15,000 kids. If you look at the next slide, which is slide nine, it gives you some of the chip funding scenarios. Um, there are three, I think, possible strategies, uh, possible scenarios that are likely. Uh, the uh, first one is that chip is funded, but without the enhanced match rate. That means we would go back from 100% to 79%. If that happens, and you assume a $47.4 million cost in 18, like we had in 17, then the remaining need for the district uh, would be the entire 47 million because there would be no federal carryover, uh, and you would have to pay 9.9 .9 million to maintain the current program as it is. Uh, if you assume in the second column, in the, in the second column that uh, CHIP is not funded, but the MOE requirements continue then we would uh, draw down uh, the 14.7 million to add that to the 47 million, or to subtract from the 47 million dollar cost. That will leave us with a remaining need of 32 million. It would have a 30% match because you, CHIP wouldn't be around, and we'd have to pay 9.8 million. If CHIP is not funded, the third column, uh, and the MOU, MOE requirements are eliminated, uh, there would be a federal carryover, but because CHIP is not funded and those requirements are, are eliminated, we'd have to pay a, 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 a local match on the uh, $14.7 million carryover. That would be uh, about $3.9 million. And then we'd have to pay uh, the remaining 30% match because CHIP would not be funded on the, re on the uh, remaining need of $28 million. And that would require uh, a payment of $12.5 million in the uh, uh, budget. Uh, we did have a visitor at, uh, at my all staff meeting yesterday from, by Senator Kane who spoke about CHIP and where they uh, were with reauthorization. He was very optimistic. He thinks that, uh, um, that, that their solution will be reached. Uh, he said there are a lot of uh, Republicans who are very supportive of it, uh, but he says it, it, it probably won't, won't get done, if it does get done, until uh, December when they revisit uh, some of the budget issues um, uh, to uh, try to nail down the budget. The uh, last issue that I'll quickly discuss is cost sharing. As you all know, uh, with a tweet, with a tweet, the president announced that he was not going to cover the uh, cost sharing payments. Uh, cost sharing is uh, uh, is a feature in the Affordable Care Act where uh, the uh, the ACA requires insurers to offer certain plans 
uh, reductions of, um, in cost sharing that they would normally not offer where they run the plans as, as they choose. Those uh, cost sharing reductions are to be applicable to persons who have incomes between 100 and 250 percent of the federal poverty level. The goal, of course, is to make sure that people who have uh, a limited income don't face onerous cost sharing requirements that uh, cause them to uh, uh, forego or eschew uh, medical treatment. Uh, the cost of these payments uh, nationally, and this again is a payment from the federal government to the insurers, it's about $7 billion in fiscal year 2017, and uh, the projections are that it would be over $10 billion in 18 and, six, and over $16 billion in, uh, uh, by 2027. It has drawn a lot of attention on, on Congress as they, people view it as a uh, subsidy, an unjustified subsidy to the insurance plans. There is a lawsuit challenging the, uh, the uh, legality of the uh, government's ability to make those payments. The Obama administration was fighting the lawsuit. Uh, the <coughs> Trump administration may decide to let the lawsuit pass, and uh, certainly given his position that the payments uh, should halt. If you turn to slide 13, the, nationally, these, this decision is, is huge. It, it will take $7 million out of the uh, uh, health care system and create uh, significant stress for a lot of the exchanges. It will not have a big impact in the district because we have very high Medicaid eligibility levels. So if you look at how many people it would touch in the district, it's about 300. Uh, the cost would be about 150000 You said, why is the impact so low? If you look at the, uh, uh, when we set our med Medicaid eligibility levels, they go up to 215% of the federal poverty level. If these CRS payments or CSR payments apply to people from uh, up to 250 percent of poverty, we only have to cover a small slice by, uh, uh, only a small slice of people are impacted by uh, the CSR payments, and those are folks whose income, incomes are between 216 to 250 percent of the federal poverty level. So there is a huge national concern about moving $7 billion out of the uh, uh, health care system. Uh, there is uh, not much to be concerned about on this front in the district. Uh, and that's all I have. Other questions from members? Councilmember Silverman. Thank you. Um, thank you, Director Turnage. Obviously, this is on everyone's mind. Um, can you help me understand what children are in CHIP? Because you say it's people who are not eligible for Medicaid. Yes. So are these youngsters who would be in the alliance if they were older? Who are the children who are covered by CHIP? If you look at the Medicaid structure, we have kids. We, Pre-chip, uh, uh, pre we have like four different tiers of eligibility. Uh, for infants, we used to go, with, the income range would be from zero to 206% of the federal poverty. So that means if you were an infant in the district uh, and your family income was less than 206% of the poverty, you were in Medicaid. All right, you would be a chip kid if your family income exceeded 206%, up to 319% up to of the federal poverty. We now take chip eligibility from uh, for each category of kids, from uh, kids who were infants, kids who were 1 to 5, kids who were 6 to 14, and kids who were 18 to 15 to 18, they all had separate lower eligibility levels in Medicaid. Uh, and so we said, if you were, if, 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 if your family has income above the Medicaid eligibility level for your child's age group, then you can get chipped up to 319 percent of the federal poverty. So. For, 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 for example, for persons age one to five, the Medicaid eligibility was from zero to 146 percent of federal poverty. That means without CHIP, the miniature family made more than made 147 percent. You no longer had insurance, uh, and so you have to go to the CHIP eligibility from 147 percent to 319 percent of federal poverty. You can only get an alliance uh, if you were not in if, if you were not in if, if your Medicaid and if your income on the Medicaid without CHIP exceeded. Uh, the current level if your income stayed at 200 percent of federal poverty because we don't take alliance eligibility above 200 percent of federal poverty okay it's complicated it is complicated <laughs> <laughs> so i'll try to try to put it in my little layman's terms because my understanding basically is those who are on the alliance i think are, the confusion is about the non-medicaid eligible right Right, so my understanding of the alliance is we're covering all those people who can't qualify for Medicaid, let's say, because they're undocumented. Only so up to 200% of federal poverty. Only up to 200%. So, so are the children on CHIP 
at 200 to 316 per, uh, 200 <coughs> of poverty to 316 percent of the poverty level is that who's in chip yeah well it, yeah it varies but again we have depending on the depending age on group. the age group uh, if you were an, if you're an infant and you you're covered in Medicaid up to 206 percent of federal poverty if you're okay. one to five you're covered in Medicaid up to 146 percent of federal poverty if you're 6 to 14 112 percent if you're 15 to 18, only 63 percent. So okay. for all of those age groups, we took we took the uh, eligibility level for CHIP and raised it to 319 percent. So if, if if in your age group, based on that federal poverty level, you exceeded that anchor, that, that level, you could then get into CHIP and at no cost to the district as long as your income didn't exceed 319 percent of federal poverty. So basically, CHIP is a program that helps families who are like the working working poor to middle, lower, sort of lower end of middle class. That is correct. And it is, it is, you have precisely hit on what the tension is at the federal government. On the conservative side, they argue that the CHIP eligibility levels are now so high that we're providing uh, uh, health insurance completely funded by the federal government to families that can afford to pay some of the cost themselves. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Seeing no other questions, uh, thank you, Mr. Well, Turnage. Uh, Madam Mayor, can we turn to the uh, next yes. item? CFO DeWitt. Uh, Mayor and Mr. Chair, members of council, I, uh, unfortunately the federal tax system isn't any less complicated. This is a microphone. <laughs> so, so this is not going to get, uh, I'm going to try to make it easy, but uh, it is a federal tax code. What's that? There is no legislation yet. So, and, and I, will, I will get into that. This is, a, I'm going to talk about the possible impact if they eliminate the state and local tax deduction, which has been around since the 16th Amendment uh, in the early 1900s when the income tax was created. It was attempted to be re eliminated uh, by in the 1986 tax reform, and it wasn't. So I do not know the probability that it will be out there, but it is certainly being considered and being talked about. Uh, the uh, important point, if you listen to uh, where the actual legislation is, there isn't any yet. So this, there's lots of proposals out there. This is a, a point to show you what this impact would be. There was a letter sent by the mayor, the chairman, and myself to members of Congress last week, uh, raising concerns about this particular deduction, and that's why we're asked. To, I was asked to talk about what it is and what it does. So under uh, state and local tax, uh, uh, currently you're allowed to du deduct state and local taxes in the federal when you file your federal returns. And you're allowed to, under general federal law, taxpayers who itemize deductions. So one, you have to itemize deductions, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. You're allowed to deduct certain non-business tax payments to state and local governments. Deductions are allowed either state and local income taxes or sales taxes, not both, and your property taxes. So if you're doing your federal filing yourself through a software or you're talking to your accountant, they will ask you for your property tax payments you made and your income tax ma payments made to local governments and you're allowed to deduct that on your federal returns. So if you look on page two of your handout, in the year 2015, which is the last year we have available from the IRS, about 40% of DC taxpayers uh, took the state and local tax deductions on their returns. So they had to itemize and about 40% of our filers took that deduction. Uh, about $2.3 billion, which is worth about $400 million of taxes they didn't have to pay to the federal government as a result of filing that deduction. So there's $400 million benefit of this deduction to taxpayers in the District of Columbia in the last uh, available data that we have to give you a feel for the magnitude of that deduction. And to show you what that looks like at the national level, and this is one, but the reason why it's being talked about is if you look at, there's a really good article in the Washington Post today about all the tax code changes that are being considered. And in the proposal that they're looking at, the, uh, the, are, they are allowing themselves to re increase the deficit by $1.5 trillion over 10 years. This deduction, uh, you can't do that, and they won't let us do those kind of things, but they can you know, have a non-revenue neutral tax code change. This deduction is worth about that much and maybe a little bit more. So this would give them, if they took that away, give them flexibility to do other things. This is worth probably about $1.8 billion over 10 years, this particular deduction nationwide. So it's something if they take it, it gives them opportunities to do other things to the tax code. So this is a chart that shows you that in the U.S. in total, about 30% of all filers take this deduction. So you have to, they itemize. So about 30% of taxpayers in the U.S. 
itemize their deductions. Most people take the standard deduction. So when you itemize, you might itemize because you have a mortgage, you might itemize because you pay a lot of, of income taxes or, or, or high property taxes, and that's something that drives people to itemize. You, when you're doing a software at, at your home, it will say, you know, do you want the standard deduction or the itemized deduction? It will tell you which one to pick, whichever one saves you the most money if you've ever done that before. When you look at those that itemize, about 28.3% take the local deduction, state and local deduction. So most people that itemize take this particular deduction. And most people take the income tax side, not the sales tax. So you have a choice of income tax or sales tax. The only reason you would take sales tax and not income tax is if you live in Florida, which doesn't have an income tax. Or you maybe buy a whole lot of furniture that particular year and you have receipts that show that you paid a whole lot of sales taxes to refurnish your home or something like that, and that's bigger than what you paid in income tax. But most people in DC take the income tax deduction and the property tax deduction on their federal income tax returns. And it's about 30% of US filers, about 40% in DC. So who benefits from this particular deduction, which is one of the issues that comes up in terms of the, uh, the lobbying efforts that go on with Congress every year as you said, come forward is, well, if you own property, this is something that you care about because you're able to take your property tax deduction, which adds value to your residence. If you can deduct, deduct the property tax, your residence is worth more. If suddenly this goes away, it's going to affect the value of your, of your property. Areas of the country where property tax payments are high, they have high rates or high assessed values. We certainly qualify in the high value area because of the affordability challenges we have with our, uh, with our, with our property. Individuals with high levels of state income taxes or have high marginal rates. So if you're in an area that has a high marginal tax rate, a progressive tax system, which, which we do and many other cities do and states do, then you're going to bit from that. And obviously, if it impacts positively the local government, there is the value whenever you are paying your income taxes or your property taxes, you're allowed to deduct it on the federal income tax return, and that puts $400 million back into our local economy which is a benefit to us to, uh, in terms of what we do as a government. So it does have a very direct impact on us as, in terms of revenue back in the economy. It has a very direct impact on people who own their home. And it has a direct impact on people who pay high uh, income taxes. So what would the elimination of that do uh, to DC residents? So if you go to, to page, page, six, or page five, now this is where Again, tax reform is complicated, as you'll probably hear someone say very soon. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna, it's going to impact us by $400 million, because the reason why it's being looked at is it's something you can take away that you can make other changes. So if the standard deduction is increased, we probably wouldn't have 30% taking this benefit anymore. They would go to the standard deduction. So standard deduction increase might minimize the impact of this. Lowering the marginal rates might minimize this. They might use this deduction to lower marginal rates. And the other thing is, is it, they could eliminate the AMT, which is something that the alternative minimum tax, if you've ever done your taxes and had that come up, you probably freaked out when you saw it, uh, because that means you're gonna pay a lot more taxes. And so that elimination might offset this. So it's impossible to say right now what the impact of this is. If they take this away and do nothing else, it's $400 million impact to our local economy. <coughs> if there's other changes made that offset it, like lowering marginal rates, increasing standard deductions, or elimination of AMT, or other things that may do, the impact might be lessened to our particular residents. But that is, again, the law hasn't been, nothing's been written, nothing's been known yet, so it's impossible to say at this time. What would be the impact to our finances? Again, to keep repeating it, it would take $400 million out of our economy without other tax changes, which again, we don't know what that would be. It would, uh, it would eliminate the property tax deduction. Think about it when you're getting ready to buy a home. When you're making that decision to go from renting to buying, you think about the mortgage deduction and the impact that that's gonna be on the taxes you're gonna get back. And you should, although people probably don't so much, think about the property tax deduction you're allowed to take. If that's suddenly taken away, all things being equal, your home's gonna be worth a little bit less in the market. So there is a long-term impact on the value of property, although that's fairly difficult to quantify. But that is something that, that we do have to be aware of. Removing a benefit of home ownership is gonna affect the value of the home over time. And the other thing that is a little twisted in this is we take the federal income tax adjusted gross income and rolls right into our DC tax return. 
if they took the deduction out, we're going to have a higher gross income on which we're going to have more taxes coming into us as a result of them taking it out at the federal level unless we have changes ourselves. So if we don't make changes ourselves, we're going to actually get more tax revenue coming into us because they will have a higher gross income on the federal return, which rolls right over. So it's something you all have to think about if this were to happen, is what do we want to do in terms of the impact it will have on our residents. Again, they'd lose it at the federal level and then they would get increased taxes at the local state level if other changes weren't made. So that's just, when, when the federal government does something because many states, including the District of Columbia, are linked to things the federal government does, it will impact us. So these are things we have to closely monitor. So just to give you a feel for some of those things on the, the next slide, it shows you, again, we don't know what, if anything, is going to be done. But the things that are out there that are being discussed and being talked about in terms of reform are repealing of the household filing uh, status. We use their definition. They, we are tied in 2018 to the standard deduction. If they increase their standard deductions, are we going to decouple from that? If we don't, there would be an impact on our revenues. Eliminating per personal exemption, that's tied to the federal one. Possible repeal of deduction of medical expenses, we use their definitions. Repeal of the estate tax, if the federal government repeals the estate tax because we've started linking ourselves to that starting January 2018, that would have an impact on our revenues. And limit deduction of corporations, we also allow the same deduction. And you can just see there's several things that are linked together. The point of this is just to show you all the things we need to be monitoring because if tax reform does go through Congress, then there'll have to be decisions made on this side whether we uh, take the same reform they did or we decouple ourselves uh, from it if, if we can. So this is just really a, uh, a highlight of what state, state and local tax deductions are. Again, it only happens if you itemize, but for those places, those individuals that itemize, it is a big hit to their, their tax bill. Unless other changes are made, which you don't know what those are, if any are going to be yet, and all the changes could have impacts that we'll have to monitor closely and it may be difficult as we're going through a budget and these things happen, we'll be obviously having to make adjustments at the policy level and the tax code level or so. So that's just a high-level summary. It's uh, no certainty here, but that's kind of what we're monitoring and looking at closely, and we'll keep you all informed whenever something real is out there that we, we can score and measure. So thank you, Mayor. Thank you. So, Jeff, um, just quickly, if the the – We've heard that their goal is to have a piece of legislation approved by the end of the calendar year. Um, and from what you know about this, when would changes happen at the federal level and uh, impacting which tax year, if it was approved yeah, so, by the end of the year? So there's always a case where they can make something retroactive and they can always make something not effective until uh, 2019. So that kind of falls into the same category. Uh, I would hope, given the complexity of it, they would not make it effective until 2019, but they could make some elements retroactive, as sometimes they do when they change elements in the tax bill, which would be complicated for us if they indeed, in, indeed did that. But my guess, if it's done responsibly, which is a very uh, caveated term, it wouldn't be until 2019. 2019. People are laughing And so if it. we were going to then make changes, if we looked at it and said we have to make some local changes, we would need to do that by when to affect our, our tax year 2019. So our so tax, uh, IRS tax rules are calendar year, and we're obviously on the federal fiscal year. So if they became effective in January 2019, they would have impact on the upcoming budget, which goes from um, you know, October 1 of 2018 through uh, September 2019. So these changes would have, if they make them effective in the 2019 calendar year, would have effects, impacts on our, uh, on our, the upcoming budget. Okay, so I think my question was if we were gonna make DC local tax code changes to be ready for your implementation for calendar 2019. Yeah. When would we need them? I would say you would probably want to do these through the upcoming le the legislative session starting in 20, assuming they did something by the end of the year, as part of the uh, the legislative actions that are coming up related to the budget, you probably want to do them at the same time okay. and make them effective uh, coinciding with those changes. 2019 budget. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And my last question before I turn to the chairman, on page three you talk about the number of U.S. filers <coughs> 
who itemize. What is that number for DC? 40%. 40%. So we're at 40%. And again, any uh, when you look at states like New York, California, uh, the District of Columbia, where you have high uh, property values and progressive ta uh, income tax systems, you're they're going to be a higher percent of filers. So we're in the upper tier. Maryland's a little bit higher than us, or like in the 43% range, and Virginia's like in the 37% range. So, but we're higher than average. Okay, thank you, Chairman. Do members have any questions, Councilmember Silverman? Oh, thank you, um, uh, Mr. Dewitt. Uh, your last page. Um, so you, you described taking away um, the uh, itemized deductions, but these other tax re reform proposals. What impact would that have? What would these have on us in terms of? Most of them would reduce our revenue. The, the order of magnitude we haven't done an analysis yet because in we don't know what we don't know what they are. Right. So there's lots of guesses, and we're waiting for that to settle down. But most of these, if we do not decouple, would decrease our would decrease our revenues. Okay. The other one that's not on here, which was in the letter, that is also out there being discussed, but it's like this one has been discussed for many years, is eliminating the ability to uh, the taxes and bonds, the ability to issue taxes and bonds, which what that means is whenever investors buy our bonds, they don't have to pay, they get to deduct the interest they earn on our bonds from their income taxes. If you can't do that anymore, they're going to demand a higher interest rate from us to buy our bonds. And that would have a really, really significant impact on our capital program if that were repealed. So hopefully that would get no traction. Uh, that would be serious and every state in the country would, would, would suffer from that on the infrastructure side. If there are no other questions from members, um, Madam Mayor, should we move on to item eight? Yes, so with that, Mr. Chairman, and I think you had several items that you want um, to be covered by the council, starting with um, the commemoration of uh, the 1968 riots, WMATA, and the All-Star Game. Sure, uh, so I'll begin with talking about uh, 1968. Although this says the uh, anniversary of the riots, actually uh, what we're beginning to look at is um, how we can remember and, uh, I don't want to say celebrate, but re reflect on the totality of events from 1968. Uh, Josh Gibson, who uh, works for the council and does a lot of our historical work, has already begun to look at this. And I'm really just putting it out here so the council members are thinking about this. And of course, we want to work with you, uh, Madam Mayor and the executive. Uh, there were a lot of things that happened in 1968 beyond just the riots. Uh, there were anti-war demonstrations in the district. There was a strike in the D.C. public school system regarding the riot, excuse me, regarding the um, war, protesting the war. Um, you know, just reflecting on 1968, uh, Marvin Gaye, who's a D.C. resident, uh, became very popular on the charts. Um, Jimi Hendrix performed at the Omni Shoreham that year. Um, so there's a lot that we can be reflecting on with regard to um, 1968. So we're going to start um, working on this uh, in the council and then wanting to come back to you, Madam Mayor, so we can work with you on that. Uh, the second item is uh, with regard to uh, Metro. Um, I think every, it's no secret that Jack Evans is the chair of the board, and um, I think it's useful for him to be continually updating us with regard to um, their situation. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, two items I'll bring to your attention, both of which you're aware of, but it's just more of a uh, continual reminder. What the chart I'm passing out now is prepared by our CFO, Jeff DeWitt, who understands the finances of Metro better than anybody. Uh, and again, you've heard me mention that the capital needs at Metro are staggering. Uh, years, year and a half ago, I guess, I gave you the three numbers, 300 million, 18, and 2.5, million was the uh, shortfall in our operating budget. 18 is 18 billion, the shortfall in our capital budget. 2.5 is now 2.8, is the uh, unfunded pension liability, $2.8 billion. None of these numbers are being addressed, and they're all continuing to grow enormously. What this chart does is explain what's going to happen on November uh, 2nd, on November 3rd, excuse me. Thursday, November 3rd, the General Manager of Metro will present to the board his budget for 
2019. Uh, the, the ask on the operating side is going to be greater than last year. Uh, we're not sure the magnitude yet, but it could be 30, 40, 50 million dollars greater than last year, which was a hundred and some million dollar ask greater than the year before. Uh, on the capital side, the ask is uh, enormous. And just, uh, Jeff, you jump in here if I don't get this right. In uh, 2017, we contributed the district, and you can see the contributions by the other jurisdictions, $120 million on the capital side. That was about the most we can give. Uh, last year, we managed to get $241 million by scraping together everything we could possibly find to give to Metro. The ask of this year, and this is Jeff and my best guess uh, from the information Metro has given us, uh, is going to be $307 million, which is way beyond anything we can really afford. And you can see the other jurisdictions are in the same uh, situation. So again, the number continues uh, in the out years uh, to be in the $300 million range. Uh, again, numbers that we cannot afford here in the district, and certainly Virginia and Maryland cannot afford them either, which brings me to the uh, conclusion of this part of my discussion. Uh, we need a dedicated sales tax, and I always, for those of you who haven't been here before, I always like to bring my props. These are the uh, studies done of Metro in the last 10 years. Okay. They're all the studies. We have dozens of studies. This one in particular I find useful, and I'll just read you... Uh, a sentence from it. Find the sentence here. Okay, the conclusion from this study. Most desirable, workable, and acceptable dedicated revenue source that compact jurisdictions can utilize, particularly since it captures funds not only from regional residents, but from visitors to the area, is an increase of the sales tax applicable to the area covered by the compact. Now this study, probably the best study I've ever read, was done by the Council of Governments, Federal City Council, and Greater Washington Board of Trade, and it's dated January 6, 2005. So this region has had this study and has debated it for 12 years and has arrived at no conclusion. And so one wonders why we're in the state we're in today. So if you look at the headline in the metro section, which I had here a second ago, today, uh, bad news for Metro riders, arcing insulators are back with a vengeance. We've had twice as many arcing incidents in the last month or two than we've had uh, in a long time. Arcing is this. Water leaks into the system, lays on the ground, the wire falls in the water and catches fire. It's largely happening on the red line, the first line built. The tunnel for the red line from DuPont Circle to Medical Center when it was built in the late 60s, or early 60s, excuse me, um, went through solid rock. No one thought the rock would ever leak, so they didn't insulate the tunnel. So it now leaks and leaks and leaks. Every fix Metro has tried has not worked. The only fix is to encapsulate the tunnel, which will cost $3 billion. And I can go on and on about new train cars, fixing the tracks, the new tunnel from Roslyn. I can get you $25 billion very quickly. None of that is funded, and if we don't fund it, the system will continue to deteriorate. The district is on board. Maryland and Virginia are not on board. My constant reminder to Maryland and Virginia that they're not on board elicits comments, as you've seen in the newspaper, from governors and Congress people who don't like to be called out on a constant basis. But I believe my job is to do just that, to call them out on a constant basis until they step up to the plate and come up with the money, because frankly, if they don't, you can see the numbers are staggering for all of us, and it's going to be very difficult to do this on a pay-go basis. The second item I wanted to talk about quickly is the Ray LaHood report. In all likelihood, will be coming out probably in the next several weeks. Um, Ray LaHood was hired by the governor of Virginia, Terry McAuliffe, to study Metro. Uh, it befuddled me at the time. I went and saw Ray immediately, took him this stack of stuff, said, Ray, you don't have to study anything. It's all been studied. Here it is. Uh, my understanding is, and I don't know for sure because I haven't seen the report, is that he's probably going to steer clear of the issue that he needs to focus on, which is funding, 
and rather focus on whether the board is too big or too small or how many board members we should have. It would be akin, as we've always heard, to figuring out the arrangement of the chairs on the Titanic as the ship is sinking. So I hope not to be totally disappointed in Secretary LaHood's study, but I have every reason to believe it will not give us the information we need. So that's uh, where we are in Metro. It's important, again, on November 3rd, you will hear a lot of discussion about the ask. And then when the Ray LaHood report comes out, you'll hear a lot of discussion about how many people should be on the board. And I'll finish with this. Keep in mind, the Metro Board has 16 members. It's a very diverse board. Those 16 members represent nine different jurisdictions, not just four. Because from Virginia, you have somebody from Fairfax, Alexandria, Arlington, and the state. From Maryland, you have somebody from Prince George's, Montgomery, and the state. So there's seven jurisdictions right there, four of us from the district and four from the federal government. So you have nine different jurisdictions with a lot of very different interests. And consequently, as you can see, when we have 13 council members, a lot of people have different opinions. There's a lot of discussion about how things should be done. So you can imagine with a 16-member board with nine different jurisdictions being represented, it's not easy to come to a consensus. And I will say this for the board. In the last year and a half, we've done a pretty good job of coming to a consensus on issues that are very difficult, late night hours, raising fares, cutting service, doing things like that. And I think the board operates today probably better than it has in a long time. And so I give my members credit for at least trying to get this thing fixed. So um, that's all we got, and just uh, stay tuned. I want to add a couple of things. Uh, I've been, as members know, active uh, through the Council of Governments on working with regional leaders and trying to come up with an agreement for a uniform um, tax, preferably a sales tax, and uh, it's difficult. Uh, Virginia doesn't want to raise taxes at all, and uh, Maryland, uh, with Governor Hogan's proposal, what's that? Well, the governor doesn't, but the counties are willing to. Uh, but the uh, governor really kind of uh, undercut everything with his proposal of $500 million in um, uh, annual funding for the next several years, $125 million from each jurisdiction, including the federal government, which he has no in insight into their making that commitment. Um, and that is not money that can be borrowed against, so it actually is about one-third of what Metro needs. Um, and yet, at the same time, it's kind of taken the Maryland folks uh, out of the discussion of coming up with a regional tax because um, they're not about to go to their voters and ask for a tax increase when the governor has said, I'll pick up the tab. So it's a really a very difficult situation. But I talked to the mayor about this. Uh, almost every, We meet weekly in almost every meeting we talk about this, and I talk with Jack about it. And uh, the three of us are very much together on all of these issues. So I'm very much on the same page. The only other point I would make is, um, you know, the uh, issue about uh, restructuring WMATA, it might be something that uh, it, it, it would be worth considering, in my view, if it greases the wheel, so to speak, to come to an agreement on a regional uniform tax. But if you think about it, um, if, if the folks from... You know, if the governor of Maryland or the governor of Virginia or even the mayor wants to complain about who's on the board and the governing structure, I mean, these are the folks who make the appointments or the reappointments, a point that you've made to me. And uh, so it, it's really kind of deflecting um, that uh, somehow we've got to change the structure of the board when they're very much a part of why the board is uh, functioning the way it is. Are there are questions from any of the members? Councilmember Che? And this is, you know, for uh, for you, Jack. Uh, I don't understand, and and everybody actually, really. Um, I know we want, you know, a regional s a dedicated uh, tax, sales tax, but why can't we do the right thing in our own jurisdiction? In other words, why don't we have a dedicated sales tax, and how much would that be? What what increase? Well, would you mind? I'm going to uh, ask uh, Jeff to to answer that that question, and it's it's a good one because we we can and. At some point, if um, the board approves an increased operating budget for Metro um, that is outsized, um, we will have to make some decisions about do we need additional revenue or are we going to cut some, some other things. And so um, if Jeff could talk about what the district being the only one to raise the sales tax, what that would mean in terms of what we could raise and then what that would mean in terms of how we could leverage it. 
that's a simple question, and I'm going to try to give a simple answer. But it's uh, as the discussions have been going on, it's a, it's a bit complicated. If we uh, look at our current compact share, in other words, our when Loudoun County comes on 35 percent, we would, if we, it was a sales tax, it would have to be, and just us, it would have to be. I believe it's like a 1.21 percent increase to collect that money for the capital side. Yep. Uh, so that would be the number just for the capital. If the operating goes up a lot, which we don't know yet, then the question we'll have to ask is, uh, uh, you all have to ask and we'll have to help with, obviously, is are we going to have a dedicated tax for operating too? So just the capital, which is all the dedicated discussions about, is a regional tax, 1% regionally, or would get you $650 million, 1% regionally. but. We are uh, we are we are 25 percent of the population, but we 15%. have 15 uh, percent, and then we have 20 uh, 35 percent of the cost. So uh, I'm sorry, our tax base is 25 percent of the tax base. Population is 15 percent. We're 25 percent of the tax base, but we have 35 percent of the metro share currently, which means our rate would be higher than everyone else. Which is one of the struggles that we're having is do we want our residents to pay more? Just go back to the, and this but is But Jeff, a, I think Mary's question is, okay, so we don't know what's happening in Maryland, Virginia. Yeah. What's stopping us from increasing our sales tax to create our metro? Well, budget? we've already started to set aside some money, as I think you know. Um, we set aside um, roughly the equivalent of um, one-fourth of the general sales tax. That's what we've set aside on an ongoing basis. and. What the council did in the Budget Support Act was to um, uh, provide for trying to increase that. Uh, but we're not going to be making that payment to WMATA without the other jurisdictions agreeing. We're, we're just, you know, we're not going to give them $10 while the other jurisdictions give them nothing. So everybody has to be in giving. But we've started to set aside the money so that when the time comes, the amount that we would have to increase the tax will be less than the full amount because we have already carved out. But, but to give you a, a, a feel, 1% increase in sales taxes on all activities is about 1 1.6, um, uh, 1 $160 million. $160 million. That's so, more than our, the increase. To simply need. answer Mary's question, yeah. we would have to raise our sales tax to 7%. Virginia and Maryland would still be at 6%, and consequently that puts us at a huge competitive disadvantage when we have a one cent sales tax higher than Maryland, Virginia. That's what we would have to do. Stop these. Other questions? Uh, Councilmember Silverman. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Thank you, um, Jack, for not only for your service, um, but for this report. Um, so I certainly think you've done a great job of elevating this issue in the press, and I'm sure that all the uh, reporters thank you for that, too. Um, I am interested in the politics of this. Um, there are various different board proposals, uh, and it seems like a lot of the heightened controversy has been around that. So can you, I, I'm, I'm just confused. Oh, can you give me a sense of sort of what, what are the different proposals and sort of what are your thoughts on them? On the board proposals? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, and how likely are they to happen? I think I'll answer that last question. I don't think they can possibly happen at all. Okay. Uh, it would take a compact change to change the composition of the board. Uh, Ray LaHood tells me on several occasions he thinks there's a legal way of doing it, has not disclosed to me what that is, so we'll see when he issues his report. But right now, um, I think uh, a compact change would be necessary. Virginia opposes strongly reducing the board uh, because Arlington and Alexandria uh, would lose their representation. And since they both contribute, they do not see the state as representing them. So there's a strong opposition mm -hmm. in, uh, in uh, Virginia to reducing the size of the board. Um, the uh, recommendation is probably going to be for a five-member board. I happen to support a smaller board. Um, okay. I was the first one to propose a five-member type control board. But as I said to LaHood and everybody else, the, the value of the control board in the district was it had extraordinary power. It had the and power to abrogate. Was hmm? and, and a lot of money was well, That's it. It had the ability to abrogate contracts, and it had access to the Treasury. See, if you remember back in, when the control board came in, the, US, the district government couldn't borrow any money from anybody, even the Treasury. 
So a control board had to be there to access money. Uh, a five-member versus a 16-member board really doesn't, I don't see, help us at all. So would a five-member board have one so, member from Well, what, what the proposal the is, as I understand, yeah. one from each jurisdiction. Right. And then one picked by the other four, which, again, under the compact, that it's not allowed. So one thing you have to remember about even the D.C. control board, which was authorized by Congress, as soon as it was set up, it was sued by everybody on every action it took. A board that's set up kind of semi-legally, as I told Ray, I mean, it would be sued immediately by the unions and everybody else. And every action it, ta it took would probably be overturned. So if you're going to do it, you have to do it right. So I think, uh, listen, it's a good question. I don't see how it's going to work. Uh, somebody suggested that we all resign. So I said, okay, all 16 of us can resign tomorrow. Now you don't have a board, so you can't run the operation because the board really supervises the general manager. So that doesn't work either. So, again, there's, we'll have to see what Ray does. We'll have to see what the reaction of the region is to it. And then uh, go forward from there. And it, it's a discussion, you know, we all should have at that point in time. But again, say, say we do that. Say we abolish the board, put in five members, get the governance issue off the table. It's kind of like getting the, the schools, renovating all the schools, taking it off the table. You know, that the kids can't learn because the buildings are falling down. Well, we all knew that wasn't true. But we fixed all the buildings, and now we're still stuck with the issue. Okay? Get rid of the board. You're still stuck with that money issue. And unless you can come up with $25 billion in the next 10 to 15 years, Metro will not continue to function in a, in a fashion that we want it to. And so you're right back in the soup again. And that's uh, the problem. And I wanted to just 30 seconds on what Jeff said. If, if the region would agree to a one cent sales tax, $650 million a year, you will never hear from us again at Metro. That will be everything we need to do to pay for everything we need for the next 25 years. It's that simple. I understand it's a regressive tax. I got the whole pitch on all of that, except that the other major systems in the country, with some variations, because Phil and I have looked into that, all use a sales tax. Mayor and I were yesterday with some, some people from Missouri that has a system that goes into Illinois that is completely funded by a one cent sales tax. And so again, it's the dynamic everybody uses. And so, if we were one state, this region, we would have a once in sales tax. And what I say to the people in Virginia who argue, well, 50% of the tax is collected in Virginia, and I got it. It's not 50% of Virginia residents. It's just people who buy things in Virginia. If this tax were put in place in 67, probably 70% of the tax would have been collected in the district because we were the retail center of the region in 67. So times change. Things come and go. And so that's what you have to look at. Uh, but every argument, and I mean, you would argue very vehemently against the sales tax, right? And so everybody has an argument as to why we shouldn't okay. do something. Well, can I respond to that? <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's go to Robert, Robert White. Uh, thank you. Um, I have two questions. The second one is, is very quick. Uh, and, and the first one, I, I, I think there may be opinion from the council chair, from Jack, from the CFO, and, and from the mayor. But could we uh, institute a, uh, our sales tax, but it have it be contingent upon sure. the other regions uh, doing the same? We, we actually, actually looked, we did that on a bill just like that. Yeah. And well, we did, we did that. that yeah. We did that maybe yeah. ten years ago. Yeah. Uh, carved out, I think it was a half a cent. Half a cent. But we, we're now doing mm -hmm. a different approach, which is to, with the increase in revenues. Uh, we're capturing some of the um, recurring revenue, and it's going into a pay-go fund, which will be dedicated to Metro as the sales tax. And until that happens, it's available to the mayor for capital expenses, we hope, for Metro. That's a, a, a practical solution, but I think doesn't send a signal to the other jurisdictions. Oh, no, we've sent every oh, signal that there <laughs> No question that the district <laughs> board. I'm not, I'm not sure I agree with that because when I read the articles about criticisms of Jack from Maryland and Virginia, you see no mention of the fact that DC has already said, "Look, we'll we'll, we'll do a sales Could tax I? and we'll do whatever is necessary." So I don't know that that's clear to the general public. Well, I'm not sure how clear it is to the general public. I know uh, I'm speaking from my uh, position as chair of the Council of Governments. It's clear to everybody who represents those jurisdictions on the Council of Governments that the district. Uh, is on board with that. And quite frankly, we, we've been trying to advocate uh, that they get on board with it. And, and you've got the issues that I think the chairman has articulated that the mayor and Jack know well. Uh, politically, uh, for them, it's just a, a much more challenging environment within which to try to convince uh, them of the value of doing this regional tax. You've got state legislatures that aren't in session as long as we are, and it's all the politics associated with that. So I, I'm not sure how much 
what else we might be able to do to send a stronger signal to the general public, but the folks who are elected to represent those areas on the council of governments are, are, are well aware of the district's position in terms of their 1% regional tax. 1% regional tax. Councilman Bounds? Um, yes. Um, my, my Sorry. question is, is that the council members should be able to vote on what they want and how do we address the issue of perhaps we cannot resolve this 1% sales tax for the region. So what happens to Metro other than it closes? Well, that's Jack's point. Yeah. If we don't get the regional tax, then uh, this, with the forthcoming budget, the chief executives and in Virginia, the counties, are going to be hit with a bill from Metro that's going to be substantially higher than what we're paying now. I mean, I think we're talking about $100 million more. Yeah, in, in the, the district. Is, question is, uh, what what happens to Metro, right? Okay, My so here's is, what happens. What happens to Metro? So we, we have to and cut. And how do we keep it running? Is really the issue. We have to cut back on what we do. So initially, we being the Metro, district. Metro. I'll talk as my Metro hat on. All right. One of the things. There's two reasons Metro is not reliable. Is because we have old train cars that need to be replaced so they don't break down, and the track structure. Fifteen years of total neglect has allowed this. The system to deteriorate and has to be fixed. <laughs> and so, you said the tunnels that leak. And the tunnel that leaks. And that's a separate issue, but a $3 billion issue. So we have to cut back on what we do, buy less cars, okay? Um, we have to uh, not do as much track work. Um, so all of the repair work that we are now doing to upgrade the system would slow down. Uh, secondly, we have to come up with the money someplace. You know, I only get money from Fairbox and jurisdictions. Jurisdictions won't give me the money. Do I then go to the fare box? Fares are already way too high. And so then the proposition be, be being discussed is maybe we don't run the system as much. Do we cut back on weekend service? Do we run it from 6 to 8 at night? Do we? What do you do to be able to make the budget? Because Metro has to balance its budget on the capital and operating side. So that's, that's what I'm saying. I mean, the answer is the system will always continue to run, but a system that is not nearly servicing the needs. And people who get hurt the most when Metro doesn't work are people at the low end of the income scale who have no other alternative. I mean, I can't say it more clearly. I say it at every meeting I go to. That's who gets hurt. So if the Metro system is slowed, that is, if trains run every 30 minutes right. or 45 minutes, is that a solution? No, yeah. it's not a solution. Not a solution. That's the it's fastest way to kill a transit system. That's what will happen. Anyway. And uh, we saw that with Safe Track. Yeah. Um, we see that with Metro um, cutting its hours, uh, its late night hours. And people laughed when we talked about it. They thought it was all a big joke, all about baseball, but it's not. Right. Um, when you have a system that doesn't stay open the hours that the city and the region it serves stays open, it will have a continued uh, just devastating effect. And you do really see a spiral because you chase people out of the system. I think it was reported this week, even at the end of Safe Track, just over a couple of months where there where people um, have a better sense the train is going to be there when it's supposed to be there, they've started to come back to Metro. Yeah. Yeah. Um, that's a good sign, which yeah. means you probably can drive around the city a little bit more uh, easily because more people are now taking up the capacity that we spend hundreds of millions of dollars every year um, for, for, for the system. So I think uh, to, to answer your question, Anita, uh, that this has to have all of our attention because we can't grow at the rate that we're growing without Metro. It is producing total gridlock. Um, not just for D.C., but all over the region. Uh, so that's why that's why we're very focused on it. Yeah, Anita, I'll just, I know people get tired of me talking about history, but it, it's important because of why we're here today. In February 18th of 2005, Dick White, who was the general manager of Metro, testified before Congress. And he said, if we don't do something today in 10 years, we will hit a death spiral. Remember the mm -hmm. death spiral quote right in this testimony here. And nobody did anything. And we're in a death spiral now. That's the issue if we don't fix this. I, I guess, and I hear all of this, and, and thank you very much for these responses. But in my head, I'm also thinking that rather than not have a system, it just seems to me if we 
reduce the number of trains. Maybe the trains aren't coming every five minutes or every 10 minutes, but they're coming every 15. Well, this is my opinion, and I'm entitled to it. Um, I think that there is a way to have the service, continue the service, and the public will understand that the trains only run every 15 minutes or every 20 minutes. Um, and well, I think still the thinking, keep the late night trains and the weekend trains. That is just I think the I thinking is that it, uh, if we don't come up with the, the additional money and the one cent sales tax would bring in, because it's dedicated, would actually bring in roughly three times the amount because it could be borrowed. And the numbers we've been looking at is $500 million in cash every year dedicated would result in $1.5 billion every year in borrowed money. And uh, if we don't do that, we cripple the system, and uh, we continue to suffer with reliability and safety issues. Robert, you had another... Uh... Um, I, I, well, on this issue of borrowed money, we continue to borrow and borrow. I'm just wondering if it isn't time for us to spend within our means. But here, Metro's needs are between 15 and 25 billion dollars, and there's no way we can. You know, we could. Do, I guess we could do a three cent sales tax, but we can't get folks to agree on a one cent sales tax. Normally, I would applaud you, but I'm not going to this time. Uh, <laughs> and, and it's nothing personal. It is. It is a. It is an issue of a huge backlog of deferred maintenance. That if the capital is so large, that this is an instance. Where you're, you, if you want to get it fixed without crippling all of our other needs in Virginia, Maryland, D.C. together, this is a case where borrowing makes sense. Because then you can get it to a reasonably affordable number of around 1%, and then you can fix it all today and not have to wait 20 years to fix it. So in this case, borrowing the big amount that you backlogged and didn't take care of, meaning the region, you can do it quicker by borrowing and keep it at an affordable, reasonable rate uh, to do it. So this is a case where borrowing makes sense. Normally they say, hey, yeah, go, go pay cash. But in this case, it's the right answer to fix a problem immediately, which it is. It's at a critical stage where it's going to start affecting our revenues. It's going to start affecting our forecast. And it's going to start affecting our economy. And it's going to start affecting other services of government. So it really, we're at a point where we have to figure out how do we afford this in a way that allows this to ramp up. This ramp up is what's required to get it fixed in a 10 year period. So we have 10 years to get this fixed, and that is a long time, but you've got to ramp it up and you've got to have a funding source to do that. And, and Jeff, I mean, all of this is great, and but my question is what if we never ever get Virginia and Maryland to agree? Do we have a, an approach to try and keep the metro system running? And what might that approach be? Can I Would Arlington and Alexandria, can they come forward without the state saying that they could come forward? And then we sort of cobble the funds together so that we can have a metro system? And I'm, I'm sincere about asking these questions. Right. May I say something? Because I, I think that you raised a very practical point that I've challenged my team to face right now. My expectation is we're going to get, uh, and I've talked to Jack about this, um, and I said, Jack, don't approve a budget that we can't pay for. He's the chairman of the board. He represents all of us. Uh, and he says, well, what, that's what we need. And I said, well, how are we going to pay for it? Uh, so that's part of where this discussion starts. We, are, we have to charge Jack um, with making sure that the budgeting process at Metro makes sense that they're advancing something that they can actually do, uh, and that they're bringing all of the, the partners on board. And while I say that, let me just pause on, on the work that Jack is doing, um, because uh, I think, from my estimation, knowing all the players, knowing what the issues are, uh, he's doing exactly what needs to be done at Metro. Is it popular among all the jurisdictions? No. Um, does he make them uncomfortable because he's calling out very specific issues? Yes. Is he right on those issues? In my view, uh, he is. And so anytime I have people from the, around the region <laughs> complaining to me about Jack and Phil, they're doing something right. Uh, and so now it's going to require, though, um, and so a lot of the behind-the-scenes work that they're doing 
isn't reported in the Washington Post. And I think that that's going to happen. Um, that work is happening too. Uh, let me also say something about uh, 20, uh, the, the next year. Uh, because uh, when, when I became mayor, Jeff sat down with me with all the numbers and the things that he was concerned about Metro. And one thing that we did was we would only approve a Metro capital budget one year at a time, where in previous years we had done it several years in a row. Uh, and at this point, I am only prepared to look at one year of Metro capital uh, still. Um, not moving forward. So the, the chairman mentioned that another jurisdiction said they're going to throw out $500 million over four years. All that is is a four-year punt. So they're saying, I don't want to talk about this for another four years. I'm going to take $125 million. I'm probably going to take it from Rhodes and Prince George's County, but I'm not going to tell anybody that, but it's coming from somewhere. Uh, we don't have a $125 million pot just to go to to increase our metro funding next year. We don't have that. Um, so it means it will have to, to come from somewhere. So I, I think at this point, uh, what we're prepared to do is look at one year of capital funding and make some decisions around our budget, whether we need more revenue, whether we're going to pause on another capital item so that we can pay those additional dollars to Metro. The next thing um, that is important about uh, 2018 is there's an election. It was made pretty clear to us that nothing hard was going to happen in Maryland until it was over. Um, so I think that we have to focus on solutions for 2018 to get us through 2018 and be very refocused on the political solutions around a dedicated funding stream that have to happen uh, in 2019. Um, and then if we don't get there in 2019, I think we get back to your question. Uh, how are we going to cobble this together? Because it's never going to happen. Because 2019, in my view, might be the sweet spot uh, for getting something done. Uh, and the, the chairman made a point about surplus revenue being dedicated and sitting in the pot. I just want to say we're not, uh, we should all be reminded that we will have a lot of needs and priorities. I asked the council to consider one of those, and that was uh, our labor pressures and how we make good on our labor contracts, uh, which is another potential use uh, for future funds. So I'm not, uh, just to uh, add to the chairman's point, that's, that's not our view. Um, our view is that future revenues have to be considered for all of our needs. I just want to echo one thing that you said in a conversation that you and I had a couple of weeks ago about this. If, if we can't come up with the regional funding and we have to do the increase in the capital for next year, meaning the budget that we have in, before us in March, there could be a capital project that's cut. I mean, when, when you and I talked about it, you said that's a school. It is a school. I mean, literally. So it's, if it's $100 million more that they ask us for, um, that's what, what it would, would amount to. We're running out or of time. Or it would be local roads, alleys, sidewalks, and trees. But it's going to be something. It would be, uh, or it would be a street bridge, or it would be, you know, we delay on south. I mean, it's all of those things. We just don't have it laying around. Uh, Robert, you had a second question, and then Melissa, and then we need to move on. Thank you. Our, our outsized portion of the metro budget, is that, is that from the charter? Is that required in the charter? Well, we pay, I think uh, Jeff was saying that we pay for the 35%. Yes. Is, is this because it does the charter mandate that we pay based on the number of stops or is this, this, this compact yes, somewhere else? In the compact. In the compact. Thank the metro compact. It's a very complicated formula. Yes. But the district pays more than a third, and Virginia pays substantially less than a third, and Maryland pays about a third. Thank you. Uh, Alyssa? Sure. I think the mayor brings up a really good point. Um, so, where is Northam? Um, so, there's a Virginia election in like two weeks. So where where is uh, Northam? I assume Gillespie is terrible, uh, but uh, I I had an impression I thought from a post editorial that Northam wasn't that strong on transportation either. Um, so will the dynamics really change? Because if Northam's not good and Hogan certainly looks like he might be reelected, well what certainly would we're for Northam. Um, I agree, but. Um, I, I think from what I've heard is his position is almost exactly like Terry McAuliffe's was. I think the difference is he would be new. Um, and Terry is, is, you know, if he had got it done this year, he would be in his final year um, and probably more amenable to proposing a new tax. 
Um, so I think I think that's what the difference is. I don't think we have any reason to think that Northam is against working on these issues, but he hasn't made any particular commitment. I guess is there anything we can do to influence him since he will be a new governor? I'm certainly with you on that. But um, I, I asked you, Melissa, on the radio show, Derek oh. McGinney show, directly. Okay. I said I know what your answer is going to be. You have to show progress and reorganize the board. Let's say that's all done. Yeah. Where are you on metro funding on the one cent sales tax? I said it's the only solution. You said no, there are other solutions. Where are you on a dedicated funding? Well, we're looking at it. So he basically dodged the question. The, the question is, neither of the governors who gets elected, either it's Northam or Gillespie, it's the legislature in Virginia okay. who gives the authority. Right, so that's a problem. And that's a that's Republican legislature that I've met with. And you know they've made it very clear we don't raise taxes in Virginia, period. So that's the back and forth that we constantly have. So, I mean, I guess that leads us to be, me to believe what's going to change, you know. And so if we don't, if we sort of say, well, we're going to keep yeah. trumpeting the sales tax, and we know that Richmond's against it, and we have a Republican governor, like, what, Here, here's what I would give you my answer. Change? Here's what my answer would be. It's the mo no one will agree with me. It's totally unpopular. You don't change until something dramatic happens. And I said to my general manager, why don't we just close the system down July 1st and let it closed until we get the ones in sales. After a week, two weeks, three weeks, how would the region respond? 42% of the federal workforce rides Metro every day. How would they respond when nobody can get to work? How would the re what does it take? We've had people killed on Metro. I, I hear We've you. We've had Jack. a shutdown and we can't get people's attention. I, I hear you, I know, I know we want to end, but I'm just saying like the, what, the feedback I get from my constituents is, like, I need to ride the system, I am rely on Metro. Yeah. And, you know, they read in the paper about, you know, what they, you know, what reporters would characterize as hijinks or whatever. And I, I think our, you know, residents are just frustrated, you know. I got it. And to, to your point, and we have, uh, and we continue to try to find different funding, um, I don't like to use the word schemes, but I guess that's what it is, funding. So we, we continue to look at different ways. and. Um, when we have something that, that we can move forward, we'll present it to you. We should move on, but I'm going to say this. The need is, there's a capital study that's $25 billion. The regional folks have agreed that $15 billion is what we're striving for. There are two ways to come up with $15 billion. Cash. Cash. Or uh, a dedicated funding source against which Metro can borrow. Those are the only two ways to come up with $15 billion. The alternative is that we don't come up with $15 billion. There really are, as I understand it, there, is, there are no other options here. Can we could tax athletes? Yeah, we could tax athletes. Uh, that would be coming up with $15 billion. And I don't think that any of the athletes earn that much, although it comes close. Uh, there was one other thing, and that was... Um, Speaking of athletes, so Major League Baseball All-Star Game. This is, I think, very brief. Charles? I don't know. I was asked to give about a 45-minute presentation. Hmm? Um, nothing better than following up that conversation than talking about baseball. Um, and it hurts a little bit that tonight's the first pitch for the first game of the World Series that doesn't include the Nationals. Um, so I was asked to talk just very briefly, and we're past 11, so I'll try to make it as brief as possible, about the All-Star Game, which the district will be hosting next summer. Um, I went down to Miami on the weekend before this summer's All-Star Game to see how their city has prepared, how they've mapped it out, um, both what looks right and what we can do better. Um, and I think both um, the mayor and I share a competitiveness that uh, we're never going to talk trash about Miami, but we can do a lot better. Um, for everybody to have kind of an understanding of what it is, though, it's, it is much more than just one big game. Uh, what they do is they create an entire week-long's worth of... Uh, very major events, um, not just at the ballpark, but throughout the city. Um, a couple of takeaways that I had from, um, from looking at how Miami had set theirs up. Um, first off, Miami chose to sprawl their events across uh, a very large area. It would take about an hour to get from one event venue to another, um, which I think was very problematic, and that's not something that we're going to replicate here. Um, Miami also doesn't have the type of transit that we have. That was very clear. Uh, 
certainly in lieu of our WMATA conversation. What's that? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? That was a bad thing because uh, ever you had to get by car everywhere. There, there was just no way to get around their city. Uh, their stadium is incredibly different. Um, they don't have the type of uh, activity, transit connections that, that we have. Uh, there's no metro. Uh, there's no businesses and public spaces around it. It's just plopped down in the middle. Um, so it created a lot of challenges. Miami, I'm sure, um, has dealt with security events before, but I don't feel like they, they knew what they were doing when it came to security. Um, there's a very heightened level of security that goes with this, but we do security and do it well here in the district all the time, so um, I think we'll be much better at, at that. Um, I also felt like there was a really big lack of connection to the local side of Miami with the events they created. Um, just a quick snapshot of what, what happens. The All-Star Game is on a Tuesday night. Home Run Derby is on Monday night. Sunday, you'll have celebrity games and what they call the Futures Game, which is where basically they have the minor league stars play a big game. And you go back to Saturday, Friday, and the events actually begin the Thursday before. Um, they have things like uh, what they call their Fan Fest, which will be at our convention center. Um, you know, the Nats already do Winterfest, and so it's, again, not something that's actually hard for us to do. I think we'll do, do very well with that. Um, there's something called Play Ball Park, which they create a very large kind of open space with fields, and the, the idea is to try to connect it to a neighborhood as well as connect with our sports leagues, work with our Department of Parks and Rec, our little leagues. And I, they created such a security perimeter that uh, it was underutilized. It also was very hard to access. Um, and it, it was empty a lot of the time. I think we can do so much better with that. And I think that's actually a place where all of us can help in terms of connecting with uh, not just our DPR leagues, but our, our neighborhood little leagues and things like that to make sure that our young people are getting the type of experience. Um, because what happens is you'll have a lot of the baseball players themselves. Uh, the athletes will come out and actually spend quality time and clinic time and things like that. Um, so it's pretty interesting. There will be a 5K um, that, in Miami at least, was packed with thousands of people. I was actually skeptical of what that was going to look like, and it actually ended up being a pretty impressive event. Um, there will be uh, a parade. There will be a whole bunch of other things that happen. From a, There's not a whole lot of specifics that we can share at this stage, because MLB will actually make a lot of the decisions at the conclusion of the World Series, so a lot of the site-specific details will kind of be in maybe four weeks or so. Um, I will say I think there's uh, the mayor and her team, the Nationals, myself, uh, a lot of others are all working really hard to make sure that we take advantage of the opportunity, that it is something that's going to be great for our city, great for our young people, great for our local businesses, great for our neighborhoods. We're trying to, uh, especially with 2018 being the year of the Anacostia and the All-Star Game being on its shores, um, trying to be creative in ways that we help showcase and highlight our city um, on both sides of the river and a lot of ways to make sure that the district really shines through this. So um, more than anything, I guess, just kind of stay tuned. It's, uh, but it is a really great opportunity, but it is certainly going to be much more impactful than just one big game or what a playoff game feels like. It will be uh, a sustained week long of events throughout the city, and then behind the scenes will be a lot that leads up to that. And let me uh, acknowledge uh, former Mayor Gray and his administration that uh, worked to, to win the All-Star Game for, for the district, and it was announced in, in 2015. Uh, let me also acknowledge Lindsey Parker, my Deputy Chief of Staff, is uh, my office's liaison with Major League Baseball on the events. Um, and Lindsay with HCMA went down, I guess, when you went, Charles, uh, to Miami to get a lay of the land and figure out how things work. I've also met with the commissioner um, about the, the our relationship with Major League Baseball leading up to um, these events. Uh, and part of the agreement uh, reached with Major League Baseball um, in 2014 uh, was how we would support uh, the games and activities with security and transportation uh, and all of the other kind of city activities that would go along with something like this. Uh, to which the chief of police told me, you know, um, that has a, has a cost, Mayor, and uh, I'll be working on what it is uh, from MPD's point of view. So just stay tuned for that because um, we may need to make some adjustments as it relates to the support of the game. Mr. Green. Charles, do you happen to know how much additional revenue was generated for 
Miami and Dade County uh, as a result of having the All-Star game there. I, and mm -hmm. I don't know whether there have been any projections as yet for what we might generate here um, in the city, but obviously that will be um, an important issue for us as we look towards the next budget. Yeah, uh, I do not know offhand what the revenue was for Miami, um, but I know I have seen, and I just, the exact number escapes me, but I can follow up with you on that, that there will be obviously a revenue increase. Um, you know, the hotels get filled up. There's a lot that goes with it. Um, you know, I remember one of the things that, that I was struck by um, when I was down there is I ended up talking with some people, some families who had come into Miami. They were not going to the game, but they had come for All-Star Week uh, because a lot of events are actually very accessible um, and a lot of events are actually free. So while the ticket price for Home Run Derby or the All-Star Game may not be something that everyone's going to be able to do, there's a lot of free events. Um, and people traveled, filled up their hotels, and they weren't even going to the All-Star Game, but they were coming for all the things that go with it for the week. So I think we'll see um, you know, that, that type of economic activity that helps. Jeff, do you have enough? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to avoid the question. Uh, Phoenix, Arizona had the ML, the, the All-Star Game, I can't remember how many years ago it was, and so I saw that, you know, direct, direct impact of that. Uh, I think we'd have to do a, a look at it, but the challenge for us is, is we, we have fairly full hotel rooms now, so it's a little harder to estimate for us than it would be for, like, Arizona, which had filled up the hotel rooms, but we, we will take a look at it, but, you know, it will... Don't go spin it all at once. <laughs> but uh, it, there will be an impact, obviously, because it is different than the Super Bowl. I mean, the Super Bowl is a big one-time event. Baseball is one, as you said, that rolls out a whole week long. And I think, it, to some degree, we have to see how we plan it and what, how we're going to bring draw people in and issues like that. But it will have an impact on restaurants and hotels, with that, unquestionably. And just so folks know the, know the dates of this, uh, it begins on Thursday, July 12th. The game itself is Tuesday, July 17th. So it, it kind of comes on the heels of Fourth of July week, which is obviously a big time here in the district as well. And it does bring in high-income people who go to the All-Star Game. You could look at the now, uh, Jeff, you could the... you could look on Google really quick. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't base revenue estimates based on MLB's All-Star Game. <laughs> It generates an estimated economic impact of $65 million for the week. Figures from Baseball's Almanac. So there you go, $65 I, I million. I will take that under consideration. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, if, uh, if the CFO will do a fiscal impact statement, sign off on that. And um, we should know it's a night game requiring <laughs> late night hours. Uh, yep. Uh, we have, hours from Metro. Madam, <laughs> Madam Mayor, we have one more agenda item. Yes. And we're way past 11 o'clock. Okay. And I'll be real quick. I understand uh, the passage of time and appreciate the thorough discussion on all the issues. On MLB, I don't know whether anybody noticed, apparently Mark Tuohy has been hired to be the manager for the Washington <laughs> <laughs> Nationals. blew it. Tomorrow's the announcement. Oh, okay. <laughs> How long will he last? Through <laughs> <laughs> the World Series. <laughs> okay, all good. All good. All right, uh, so what I'm going to talk about really quickly are just uh, three um, areas, if you will. One set of cases that are approaching resolution, still more work to be done, uh, a new front that OAG is uh, moving forward on, and then a problem that I think probably has impacted uh, most of us. Um, first, I just want to say, uh, as a relatively new member of this governing body, how much I appreciate uh, the mayor, uh, Chairman Mendelson, and so many council members and staff, uh, all sharing thoughts and prayers on behalf of, uh, for my mom. Um, I really, really feel like I'm part of a, a family, uh, and I just want to thank you all for your generosity. Um, as to the three cases, the ones that are approaching wrap-up, these are the housing cases that we brought, slumlord cases. Some pretty interesting developments there. On one of the matters, Terrace Manor, uh, we... Um, settled the matter in a way that the tenants are actually going to get money in their pockets, which is fantastic. So 12 current tenants and 35 former tenants uh, will get an average of about $9,500 as a result of having to be forced to live and or leave a place that they would like to stay, but because the landlord was not maintaining the property, um, people who could 
did in fact leave. So that's a significant uh, result. I should note that W.C. Smith has been an extraordinarily positive partner coming in for Sanford Capital uh, and uh, is uh, promising to uh, really renovate uh, the building uh, at issue in a top flight way. Uh, we'll work with them, make sure they do just that. So good news on Terrace Manor. Uh, still wrapping up uh, some things with respect to uh, Congress Heights, again, against the Sanford Capital uh, outfit. We were real happy that the court appointed a, a well-known and highly regarded receiver, David Gilmore, uh, to uh, that property. And uh, Mr. Gilmore will report uh, in a few weeks uh, as to what his plan is. So um, there we had, again, uh, a lot of tenants who were uh, forced to live in not so good situations. Uh, we are continuing uh, um, another investigation, 11th Street uh, property. Uh, that's going to come to completion soon. It's in court now. And it looks like we've got several other cases in the hopper to file. So housing cases sending a message, really, you know, to the minority of uh, landlords and developers who are uh, in the slumlord business, but trying to get that out of the District of Columbia. The new front uh, is after uh, a lot of hard work and certainly council support, uh, we're going forward with uh, our wage theft initiative. You might see in front of you these wage hour log books that we're preparing uh, for employees from at least three sectors, construction, home health care, and the restaurant industry, where uh, unfortunately, not most, but some employers, um, you know, continue to steal money, essentially, uh, from employees. So uh, we're going through a real big process of educating employers and employees as to their obligations under the new law. With these login books, we'll have data that we can use in cases, uh, and we're moving forward there. So thank you, um, Council Member Silverman, and so many others for your support on uh, that legislation. Lastly, uh, the Equifax breach was a significant breach that impacted over half of D.C. residents, myself included, and Natalie as well. Um, there you go. So uh, the D District of Columbia Office of Attorney General is leading a 48-state, uh, multi-state investigation of Equifax. We've been in touch with uh, counsel and the company in that regard. If I can leave you with a couple things that you should do right now, um, they are... Number one, put a credit freeze on your account. Uh, thanks for the council's passage of the emergency uh, credit freeze legislation. That essentially will mean that the credit freeze that you put in uh, will not cost you any money. Uh, that's number one. Number two, if you don't check your financial stuff uh, online on a regular basis, you really should. Uh, these breaches are happening all the time. Uh, and thirdly, uh, you know, to the extent that the company doesn't resolve the matter in a, a fair way for everybody, we'll obviously have to bring suit, and we'll keep you posted on that. That's all we got. Did you say that the district is leading the uh, Equifax? We are. Education? Yes, uh, we and, uh, if I'm not mistaken, Pennsylvania are uh, the co-leaders of that investigation. Great. Uh, any questions from members? Madam Mayor. I don't have any further questions. Let me uh, thank everybody for all the, the very useful information uh, that was presented. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good job.